Welcome to Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. Join our host, certified clinical mental health counselor and Christian psychotherapist, Dr. Frida Cruz, and her guests as they discuss real-life issues and offer expert clinical advice and solid biblical application for any and all life situations. Now, here's the host of Time for Hope, Dr. Frida Cruz. Welcome to another edition of Time for Hope. I'm Dr. Frida Cruz, your host, and today I would like to welcome as my guest, author, and pastor, Dr. Rob Green. Rob has written a book titled, Tying the Knot, subtitled, A Premarital Guide to a Strong and Lasting Marriage. In his book, Rob gives us a practical, biblical, and Jesus-centered premarital book to use with couples preparing for marriage. If marriage is really designed to put the love of Jesus and His bride, the church, on display, then it stands to reason that we should be talking about Jesus from the very beginning with couples who are preparing for marriage. Stay with us as Rob and I discuss the critical areas that need to be covered in premarital counseling in a way that keeps coming back to Jesus at the center of it all. And Rob, it is great having you all the way from the state of Indiana here with us today. Thank you for, uh, you know, taking the time, flying in, and sharing your book with us. That's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've done something with your book, uh, actually, um, I, having been a counselor, a licensed professional counselor for 25 years, uh, I, I did a lot of premarital counseling, a lot of marital counseling, and uh, so forth. So I'm familiar with some of what you have in your book, but not the, uh, the whole idea of uh, when when they're preparing for marriage, looking at it being a Christ-centered marriage or focusing in on, as you have in your book, of uh, looking at it as, uh, you know, being a Christ-centered marriage. And I, I like it. I really like it. I think that Christ is really the center of every area of life. And so, therefore, when I'm trying to help young couples, and even those who are older, who are getting married, uh, understand is that Christ really has to be the center of their entire existence. And I'm simply drawing it from passages like 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Glory of God, yes. And you carried it all the way, even uh, eventually, to the sexual relationship and uh, so forth. So often when a couple is um, preparing for marriage uh, or even going through the wedding and everything. Early on, I think we would have to admit that so much of it is focused on their passion for each other and the intimacy part of the marriage without actually looking at the real issues that will be surfacing soon uh, in their relationship once they're married. Yeah, there's certainly some truth to that. And I'm trying to help them understand that even in an area like intimacy, that Christ has to be the center even of that. And if they do, they understand that the Bible actually has a tremendous amount to say about intimacy, that they will learn that um, sex is really not about performance, which is what the world gives us mm -hmm. as the bill of goods, but it's really about relationship. And so I want to help them to learn to enjoy that journey rather than come in with expectations that they think will be fulfilled. Hmm. You know, uh, I can go, I go back a few years and I can remember when Dr. Roy A. Kemp in Texas wrote a book, uh, My Bed is Green. And what he had done, um, he took the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, and as you know, that has to do with a picture of Christ and his bride, and also had to do with King Solomon and his bride. And he wrote a book uh, talking about the sexual issues which was a no-no in those days. And he was criticized. He was a sharp 
professor at Bible Baptist Seminary. He was criticized for writing such a book then. And of course, now anything, it's okay to write anything or, uh, you know, show anything on TV and all of that. But uh, to go from that uh, to, you know, to where we are now, but at the same time, very often the biblical whole biblical idea of of making one person a a bonding through the intimacy and the sexual relationship is left out. Yeah, I agree with that, uh, which is one of the reasons why I made it a point. Uh, in fact, speaking about the Song of Songs, I remember one day in seminary we were attending chapel and someone. Uh, spoke on the Song of Songs, and afterwards all of us seminarians were out in the lobby and we were laughing at one another and with one another, saying that was the best sermon we'd ever heard on the Song of Solomon. And then as we reflected on that, we all said, well, it's the only sermon that we've ever heard on that. And so the whole point was I dedicated to myself to being willing to talk about the issues because God speaks about it often in His Word. I have a couple that are writing a book now that I uh, know and I count them as friends and both of them have been married previously, maybe once or twice, and uh, but now they have a, a Christ-centered marriage and they have their devotions, they share their, uh, their morning devotions together because he's a businessman and they can afford uh, to do that. And uh, it is so wonderful what they're sharing and I've encouraged them to get it into book form and they're following my encouragement. I don't know how far along they are, but it, uh, it is, a, uh, you know, when a couple can do that, that uh, can help them form a, uh, a Christ-centered rather than an uh, uh, each-centered marriage. Yeah, I think most couples realize pretty soon after the wedding that the horizontal relationship does not provide all of the motivation that they need in order to respond in godly and Christ-centered ways to various situations that come up in the ongoing years. And there needs to be something more than that, and that is their relationship with Christ. And when a person understands what Christ has done for them, when they understand all of the resources that Christ has provided them, then all of a sudden that frees them instead of having to demand something from their spouse, to being able to freely give it. And so I think of Christ's love as filling me up so that I am free then to love and to give and to serve others. The most important other uh, would be my spouse. And as couples understand that, they stop demanding things from one another, and then they think about how can I serve one another. Just practically, think about a man who goes to work and he's had a hard day. And so it's just been one of those tough days at work. And he's thinking, man, I can't wait till I get home where my wife is going to serve me. I mean, she's going to have a wonderful meal on the table. All the kids are going to be orderly, handled properly, homework done. And well, he gets home and what he doesn't realize is that his wife's had a hard day too. And there have been some challenges that she's experienced. And so she's waiting for him to get home because she's looking for some help for all of the things that have gone wrong. And so dinner's not done and the homework is not done and the children are acting like hooligans. And so she's waiting for him to return. Well, you can see the clash that's about ready to happen. And in that moment, Christ at the center has to speak and they have to understand what it looks like to say, all right, how is it that I can serve? Uh, my spouse today. So rather than thinking about how my spouse is going to serve me, I'm thinking about how I can serve them. You know, when I, as you're talking, I'm thinking of the scriptures that uh, I, I just actually uh, presented them and used them in our Monday morning uh, worship services here um, that uh, tell us that we're to walk as Christ walked. We are to be like Him. That, that is to be our goal. And you say one of the major, uh, you've talked about the top three things that a couple needs to discuss uh, pre-marriage uh, when they're planning to marry and so forth is about their relationship with Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I totally agree with you on that, that they need to be able to share where they are in their relationship with Christ. And if they are willing, 
uh, to, let, uh, to let that spill over, as it were, uh, into the marriage they're approaching. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's simply a reflection of what we find in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Uh, we have a whole series of instructions given to individuals, persons. And then we find instructions from Ephesians 5, 22 to verses 33 about marriage, about spouse, about partner. And so how is it that you're going to be a godly husband? Or how is it you're going to be a godly wife if you're not, first of all, a godly person and one committed to growing and changing to be more like Christ, to fulfilling the commands of whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God? Or to think of 1 Peter 2, 9, which tells us you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may declare His excellencies. And so how is it that you organize your life around glorifying, honoring, pleasing Christ, that's going to determine then how a person functions in their marriage. I'm going to ask you, uh, did you learn this in your marriage or did you uh, already uh, have this figured out, as it were, uh, pre-marriage? Yeah, great question. You know, my wife and I have been married for almost 23 years now, and uh, God just blessed us with both families who uh, our parents love the Lord. They're still married today. In fact, we were just thinking about organizing a 50th wedding celebration for my wife's parents. And, uh, and so we've really had good role models for us from the beginning. We were both in good churches that taught us the truth. And then we did have some pre-marriage counseling that helped us to refine and to reflect on what things needed to be true for us. And so God worked in our lives early on, and we praise Him for that. But then I've also had the privilege of serving as a counselor on our church staff. And, you know, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of people whose marriages have not gone very well. And so many of the lessons that are included in the book today actually come not solely from pre-marriage counseling, but actually come from marriage counseling. And that is, uh, essentially, I like to think of it this way. I'm offering my counselees, this couple, a scholarship. You can either learn the lessons on your own, or you can learn the lessons from someone else, and here are some of them. Yes. Uh, well, maybe we can just pick up where we left off, but they're telling me we need to take a break, and we will be right back. There is a saying I was reared with that goes, you get out of something what you put into it. This could well be said about a marriage. Two people in love doesn't guarantee a great marriage. Good marriages don't just happen. They have to be worked at. The embers of passion between marital partners can easily die out if they are not fanned by a commitment to keep them alive. Unresolved conflict, resentment, anger, unkind words, and lack of time can suffocate the flames of marital passion. Sexual passion will accompany respect for each other, learning to identify and meet each other's authentic needs, spending couple time together, and honest and loving communication. Unrealistic expectations regarding marital passion can bring disillusionment within a relationship. Couples cannot afford to allow movies and soap operas to set the standard for marriage and marital passion. Instead, look to the scriptures for God-given instructions and directions regarding marriage and passion. One of the things you will find is that marital passion is approved by God. I suggest reading the Song of Songs. You will find there love and passion being expressed between a bride and groom, actually a picture of our relationship with Jesus Christ. The scriptures also make it very clear that sex and passion should be confined to the marital bed. We read in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Assuring and proving to your spouse that you are committed to Jesus Christ and your marriage can provide an enjoyable, passionate, and lasting marriage.
thanks for staying with us on Time for Hope. My guest for today is Dr. Rob Green, and we're talking about his book, Tying the Knot. And that's such an expression, uh, and then the title of your book, that, I don't know who came up with that, but it was a, a great idea. Uh, yeah, I, think, I can't take credit for that one. <laughs> yeah. um, we, you gave your own personal, I asked for it, your own personal experience in your marriage, and, uh, and, and I'm sure some of that's coming into this book or bleeding into this book as it were from 20, how many years? Uh, almost 23. Almost uh, 23 years uh, of marriage. And, but what I'm assuming and what it sounds like is that you and your wife both coming from um, Christ-centered uh, marriages or families and then it, uh, both of you being Christ-centered in living your own lives, that that it it flowed. Did it flow rather easily then for you in in the marriage? Yeah, you know, we committed our very first year and said uh, we are not going to argue. Um, that doesn't mean we'll always agree, but we're not going to argue about it. There's a difference. There is a difference. And so we just made that commitment. We're, that's just not how we're going to do our marriage. And part of the reason is both my wife and I were known as intense people. And so one of us, one person actually told us uh, we could sell tickets to your fights. And uh, they were just simply predicting what may happen. And so we just dedicated ourselves to the Lord that we were not going to do that. And then after the first year, we realized, wow, um, that wasn't as hard as I thought. This was actually not all that hard. In fact, mm -hmm. we had a wonderful time and said, well, if we did it the first year, we probably can do it the second year mm -hmm. too. And I have just decided that, you know, the Lord has provided a wonderful instruction manual on marriage, and that is the Bible. And so it tells us a great many things about how to live and how to function in marriage. And I've had the joy of learning about that, talking about that. And the more I talk to others about it, the more I'm hearing myself. And so we've just had the wonderful joy of being able to experience a lot of blessings that come in marriage. I'm going to ask you another personal question. Uh, did you ever hear your parents fight or argue? Uh, no. You no, did not. No, my parents didn't do that. You that are doesn't so mean they fortunate. Dis <laughs> That's you true. You have to remember that. You're so fortunate. Not everyone is that fortunate. They can come from good church-centered uh, homes and be reared in church and all of that and still not uh, have the parental, which you've gotten, have listed, uh, is essential checking into the parental background, not have the parental background. And then some have suffered abuse. Uh, in their home, uh, from you know, from mm -hmm. one of their parents, or sure. uh, in their homes, they haven't come from the background you're talking about. And actually, this kind of thing can lead them, as it were, uh, into bad marriages, uh, and them carrying that burden and that pain and everything, see, thinking that a marriage uh, will uh, heal them or cause the pain to cease, which it will not. It very often can increase it uh, because they so often can be attracted to the wrong spouse, the wrong person. Uh, and leaving Christ out, they have to look to somebody uh, to heal that pain. So coming back to... Uh, that's one of the things you say a couple is to discuss, and we've already talked about that. What is your relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, I agree completely with you that not everybody has experienced what I did. And that, so they're not coming with that background. But here's the great joy. That's one of the reasons for, for the book. And that is to actually have conversations with the people who are about ready to get married to find out where some trouble spots might be, to learn what may be uh, a, be a risk for as they get married and to think about how they're thinking about marriage. And those opportunities are things you couldn't do without personal conversations. And so this book is not just a book to be read. It's a book to go through with someone, someone who is experienced, someone who is older, someone who is going to help you walk through the truths of Scripture so that that doesn't have to be true for you. I don't believe that just because someone experienced something bad in their past, 
that that necessarily sets them up for failure in the future. I think Christ redeems all that. He can heal all of that. Mm -hmm. But it's a willingness on their part to seek it out, to seek out that help, and to uh, learn about the significance of Christ. Well, that's one of the reasons you have the questions and discussion questions and so on and so forth at the end of each mm -hmm. chapter, isn't it? That's uh, right. That they, can, uh, that they uh, can work through, which I thought also was a good idea. So the four things that you said that they should discuss and decide before uh, engagement are their wedding. And the first one is what we're talking about, the parental support. What kind of parental support do they have uh, from both sets of parents, if they, uh, if they, you know, if they have both sets, uh, in supporting them in in the marriage that they uh, are planning for, and then the physical standards of conduct that are going to go on during their engagement period, during their dating and engagement period. That's correct. Yes, uh, that would be a hard decision for a lot of couples these days when. Uh, you know, it it wasn't during my the my days as a teenager and and young adult because it was decided for you. Uh, but it, that's not true these days. Some other things are are is so much uh, freer related to the conduct uh, and so on and so forth of uh, male female uh, engaged. Uh, people and so forth. Are you getting what I'm saying? I am, and I try to explain to them that why do something now when you have 50 years to figure that out later? You have 50 years to enjoy all of it. And so why do something that would dishonor the Lord and put your relationship in a bad position prior to ever being married? So I try and, to show them the benefits of yeah. those standards. And why not uh, maintain abstinence until marriage so that you have really something to look forward to. Uh, and uh, then the uh, testimonies of conversion to Christ, we've talked about that. And two paragraphs um, in your book on, uh, you want them to write two paragraphs, right, as to why they want to marry this particular person. That's right. Yeah, and uh, I bet you get quite a, a a counselor could get quite a number of answers to that. Well, you know, one of the things I'm looking for is many of them are going to say, oh, she's so wonderful, or he's so wonderful, so and I love him so much. So exactly. So and one of the, that sets up a very important lesson that they need to learn, and that is that so often uh, people get married, they look for somebody who is going to help them love themselves more than anybody else has. Not how much they're going to love someone else, how much that person is going to help them love themselves. And so it's a great opportunity for me to discuss the importance, yet again, of Christ and the significance of what genuine, true, biblical love looks like. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that, what kind of love can you give uh, to your spouse rather than wanting it all to come in your direction from your spouse. You know, uh, some people, and I've, I used to uh, teach this regularly, uh, couples drain, can drain each other dry, trying to get from them what they can't give or sometimes won't give uh, and so forth when uh, we're going at it the wrong way to get it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So would you agree with me I on do. that? Yes. Um, I think they're telling me we're getting near the end. And what I've decided, uh, Rob, is that there's two weeks worth uh, of good stuff here uh, with your book. And we're going we're gonna to take that uh, route uh, and, and just pick up next week with where we're leaving off today. Does that, uh, okay. that feels good to you? And... Um, then I have something to share with you uh, from my viewers, uh, a couple of things actually to share with you uh, from some of my viewers. Um, and the first one is, Dear Dr. Frieda, please pray for myself and my wife. Uh, we desire God's anointing and protection over our lives. We are recently married and are both involved in worship ministry. So we are more than glad to uh, pray for this couple as we do each and every prayer request that comes into Time for Hope. It's already been covered. We've already covered it uh, in prayer. And it, it's interesting they're asking for God's anointing, which of course is a work of the Holy Spirit. 
and also uh, protection, and added that they were recently married and both involved in worship ministry. So uh, it sounds like they're on a good track for a good, strong marriage, and but they're still asking uh, for us to join them in prayer, which, as I said, we have already done. If you haven't shared your prayer request with us, we invite you to do it. Uh, share it with us, and we'll do the same thing uh, for you. We have great uh, a great number of needs that come in. Um, from uh, our viewers asking us to pray with them and for them. And then I have an encouraging note. Dear Dr. Frieda, your Time for Hope program is always absolutely wonderfully helpful for me. Thank you for that. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Philippians 1, 3, and I appreciate adding that scripture to that also, very encouraging. And then the next thing that I would encourage you to do is to help us financially. Uh, we're worldwide now, and uh, it would be great having you join us as a um, financial partner uh, of the ministry uh, as we, uh, as we uh, and help us share the expenses of uh, carrying this ministry across the world. And then the, the last thing is I say to you, be sure to join us again next week on Time for Hope. A free fact sheet that contains additional information about today's topic is available upon request from our ministry. You can also receive a copy of today's resource for a donation of at least $20 to the Time for Hope ministry. You may call us at 800-669-9133. Write us at Post Office Box 2169, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304. Or visit our website at timeforhope.org. When you call or write, prayerfully consider a donation to our ministry. Our ministry's mission is to offer hope to discouraged and hurting people. As we continue to give out messages of hope, a financial gift of any amount to support this ministry will be greatly appreciated. When you do this, you are joining us in offering hope to many viewers seeking help and hope for their situation. This will also enable us to inform and inspire some viewers to expand our mission as they learn and in turn can minister more effectively to hurting people around them. Look for Dr. Frieda's scriptural devotions on our Time for Hope TV ministry Facebook page. And to see this program again online, visit our website or search for the Time for Hope TV ministry on YouTube, iTunes, Roku, or Facebook. Join us next week for more on today's topic. Until next time, have a great week. And remember, it is time for hope.